Okay, good evening. Uh, it's been a great time already. Let's open up to John 14. And uh, GR, did a great job at the communion. Uh, it is great to have family members that are disciples of Jesus. Uh, it really is a testimony to my wife's faith. I think it was 10 years till anyone in her family became a disciple. And then JR, as he shared, was a disciple and left. And I think about another decade passed, and now he's back. And, uh, of course, Kat is as well. And uh, God answers prayer in his time, amen, if it's his will. A question here for you on the front end. Have you ever had something troubling you and made you afraid? Uh, Thursday, I got a call uh, from my dad, and he's here with us tonight, and uh, my mom was having some heart issues again. Uh, she's had a couple of stents put in. She's had a couple of heart attacks about three years ago, and since Monday, she's 85. Now, her heart rate could not come down below 120, which is really fast for that age, um, so she went into the doctor for some tests because I think you should go to the hospital. I think they can do it there. The insurance can cover it and this and that. So it seemed fairly routine, but uh, they admitted her when she was there. They couldn't get her heart rate down. So she was uh, in the hospital room there. And I finally got over there about 8 o'clock. And I thought she was fairly stable. But what I stepped into uh, was not stable. It was very uh, alarming. Uh, she had had congestive heart failure. And I said, where's her room? And I was trying to talk to the nurse, and I saw like these five people, the nurses, and then the doctor came around her bed in a very small area. And uh, I say, what's going on? She, they, and the nurses uh, were nervous. And then we have some nurses in the uh, audience here. When the nurses are scared and you can see it, there's trouble, right? And I picked up on that, and I was fairly calm at the time. And then the doctor came, and he was great. Um, you know, and I go, what's going on? He goes, I have no idea. And he goes, that's why I'm here. I just got on duty. And he's kind of going through the notes. So I was with him there for about a half hour. And uh, then they came out and they said, doctor, we can't get her heart rate below 160. And her blood pressure is almost 200. And she's in distress. She can't breathe. He goes, let me come in. So he comes in. And then I come in. And uh, I see my mom. And uh, they have the bag, you know, over her face. And I'll never forget the look in her eyes and staring at her numbers there. Uh, she was terrified. And the doctor goes, you know, this is really hard because uh, it feels like you're being suffocated. And um, so she's just breathing very heavily in the bag. And, you know, I'm just praying. And I'm thinking, is this it, God? You know, and uh, so our eyes met. And... Uh, you know, the doctor goes, okay, so he started ordering all this stuff. Her, her lungs were filling up with fluid, and it was bad. And things were very uh, uh, chaotic there for about an hour. So uh, he got her heart rate down to 120, and, and slowly the blood pressure started to come down. I go, is she stable yet? He goes, no, she's not. I think it's going to be a few hours if nothing else comes up. So the tech came in and ran an EKG, and he noticed the stress in the room. And he just screamed, will everybody please calm down? This is the tech taking the EKG. I mean, because I cannot concentrate on what I'm doing because there was just people everywhere. And so I'm just watching all this. And, uh, you know, they did the tests. And then he, and he goes, okay, I figured out what it is. She has congestive heart failure. Now I know how to treat it. So he ordered Lasix to start draining the fluid. He got some stuff for her heart and the blood pressure. So a little, it came down a little bit. And uh, so I prayed with her. And I stayed a little bit longer, and then I called back, and, and she started to stabilize a little bit that night. So the next day, the cardiologist came in, and so look, Friday afternoon around 4 o'clock, they did a procedure. They went up through her thigh with a cord, I guess, some kind of a needle, and he shocked the heart, similar to what Isaac Hernandez had, I, I think, uh, last year, and it worked. It slowed, to, to shock the heart to slow it down, because he could not get it below 120. If that didn't work, they were going to have to put her on medication, but it worked, praise God. So she uh, is alive, um, and, you know, her numbers have come down. She is home, and she's like a cat. She's had uh, a number of lives. She hasn't had nine yet, uh, but she's had several. And, um, you know, we're grateful that she's still with us. So I share all that because the whole backdrop of John 14 is Jesus trying to comfort the hearts 
of the disciples. They are troubled. They are afraid. A little panic that he was leaving them. They didn't know where he was going yet, to the cross, but they soon would find out. And the title of the lesson is, Do Not Let Your Hearts Be Troubled. Let's pick it up in verse 1 of John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. The first thing here I want us to look at is heaven. When we are troubled, Jesus wants us to think about heaven. God has many rooms for all of us. Isn't that encouraging? Let's get a little glimpse of what those rooms are going to look like. Let's go to Revelation 21. Keep your hand there in John 14. We'll come back. And if you're ever down or discouraged, I encourage you to spend some time in the last two chapters of the Bible, the end of Revelation. Very, very encouraging. They talk about heaven. Let's pick it up in uh, verse 1. John get a glimpse. John gets a glimpse of heaven. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Verse 15, same chapter. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod, and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. That's 1,400 miles, church. Imagine from here, is Denver about 1,400? Right about that. Bill knows, he used to drive it. From here to Denver, the holy city of Jerusalem. Imagine the sight of it. The angel measured the wall using human measurement. And it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper in the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, agate. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, onyx. The sixth, ruby. The seventh, crystallite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, turquoise. The eleventh, jacinth. And the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. Let's go to uh, chapter 22, verse 18. I want everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to their person, to that person, the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes away words from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Amen. Is there any doubt that heaven is going to take our breath away? It is going to be amazing. That's where we're heading as disciples of Jesus. And as uh, Greg Moretzky said yesterday, PTL, right? Praise the Lord for that. PTL. No more crying. No more pain. No more homework, students. That's pretty cool, right? The son's in here tonight. He's happy about that. How much do you think about heaven? 
Did you think about it this week? For me, I don't think about it a lot. Not enough. As we get older, we probably do think about it a little bit more. I remember spending you know, a number of days with Steve May before he passed. And he'd always have his Bible, and I'd come over, and I'd go, Steve, what are you reading about? It was a couple weeks before he passed. Heaven was his answer. Every day, he knew he was going. It's our final resting place. We're all just passing through this life. Wasn't that a great song, Anchor for the Soul? We all are just passing through. But don't be troubled, Jesus said. As the song goes, you've got a home in heaven. Why don't we think about heaven more often? And we're busy people, I think. We're busy. I know we are. Our family is. All of us have busy lives. And we got a lot going on. But I think there's something else. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul talks about it here to the church in Corinth. Let's pick it up in uh, verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. And this past week, we had uh, three days together as our staff. We had some staff meetings. And on that retreat, it was great to be together with the Inland Empire staff. We've got a great staff. We've got great friends there. It was very personally ministering to me, and I think, I think we're going to help the church. We planned the whole 2016 calendar. Amen? We got that done. It took about four hours. Uh, that was quick for us. Uh, but we had some great talks, great prayer time. And on that retreat uh, was Simon and Rima, who have led the church, the, the hens, who have led the church in Cairo for many years. And they're hurting right now. Uh, they, uh, Rima stepped down from leading. Uh, they resigned. Uh, they're on a break. And they're here to get strengthened, get encouraged, and to get some additional training. And they don't know their future. And I was talking to Simon there just uh, at the meetings. And we were just talking about uh, our lead evangelist, Mike Rock. With Simon, he was able to get into the Sudan this summer. And to me, Simon is a hero. Uh, he was converted at San Diego State. And he asked, he's from the Middle East, he asked to go over on a mission team. And, or maybe it was UC San Diego, I'm not sure, one of the two schools. He asked to go on the mission team in the Middle East. They go, where would you like to go? He said, I want to go to Baghdad, Iraq. And they said, are you serious? You want to go to Baghdad? Yeah, I want to go to Baghdad. He's a radical guy. And I don't know how many of us would ask to go to Baghdad. But he went over, and uh, through him, uh, so many of his family members have become Christians. I mean, it's got to be over 50 people. And we see how much MJ's put in with her brother and just with her sister. I mean, it takes a lot, right? He has so many disciples uh, that are from his family. And uh, so much, uh, as Scott has shared of the Middle East now, and there's over almost 700 disciples, is through Simon's one seed that has just spread literally throughout the Middle East. So he's a hero in my book. So he was talking about Mike in the Sudan. He goes, you know, Mike's a really bold brother because in the Sudan, first of all, it took Mike five years to get in, and they've been asking him to come. We have 60 or 70 disciples in the Sudan. And it's a, it's a good number. I was surprised how many there are. And uh, Mike has been trying to go, but as an American, he hasn't been able to get in for like five years. This summer, he got in. And uh, I'm going to ask him, Mike's going to be out here uh, this fall to preach to us in a couple weeks about missions. I think it's in uh, October, November. We got it down. Before he goes back over again, I want him to share about Sudan. I'm sure he will. So he got in and he went with Simon. He said, Danny, the Sudan, you just breathe the air and you get dysentery. It is so easy to get sick. There is so much illness and poverty and extremely dangerous outside of just the capital city. I mean, it's lawless. It's just gangs roam the country with machine guns and the whole thing. I mean, it is lawless. So they were in there for about four or five days. And he was just sharing how faithful the brothers and sisters are in Sudan. Actually, I don't even know if they're sisters, just the disciples there. Um, they live by faith. You know why? Their sight is miserable. It's horrible all around them. Horrible poverty, illness, disease, war, horrible, horrible crime. 
And right now, I read an article this morning on it in Europe. It is huge news about all the refugees, right? They're just flooding all of Europe. And I talked to someone earlier, they're from Sweden and places, a lot of them want to go to Sweden or the Scandinavian countries or Germany, just all over the countries in Europe. There's hundreds of thousands literally fleeing. You know where they're fleeing from? The Middle East. They're fleeing from the Middle East. You know the majority? From Syria. That's where the majority are coming from. There's civil war going on right now in Syria. Literally, it's hell on earth. I saw a picture this week on the CNN. They were just showing some children the ages of, my kids are 11 and 9, just school children, my kids' ages, literally just standing there in the streets. There must have been about 100 of them with just the buildings, come, they've come down, just rubble everywhere. And I saw that, I said, man, that breaks my heart. I mean, here's kids, this is how they're growing up. This is their memory of childhood, not going to school, even though we complain about it, right? Not playing sports or playing games or whatever. They're there in this incredible, chaotic, very dangerous country. You know, I think in the Sudan and in Syria, the disciples think about heaven all the time. All the time. In the first century, they thought about it, didn't they? They wrote about it. They preached about it all the time. And there's a great brother that I believe is with the Lord right now in heaven, Chuck Nussbaum, who's gone ahead of us. And a few of us remember Chuck. Uh, he was in his 80s. Uh, he was late 70s when I met him. And he was always trying to stump the minister. He would always come up. Usually right before I'm about to preach, he'd come up and say, who's, uh, who's, who was David's son that went on to be king? And I would say, uh, Solomon. He'd say, that's right. Now go preach. You know, <laughs> he has this character. We love Chuck, right? And uh, he had one of those for me one time. And uh, he came up to me and he said, what's the goal of a Christian? And I thought about it. And I, and I had about 10 seconds where I was going up to preach. And I said, get to heaven. He said, that's right. That's the answer. He was right, right? It is the goal of a Christian to get to heaven. Now here in the desert, it's starting to cool off. Amen? Hey. PTL, right? PTL. Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, I was walking in with my brother and I goes, man. I don't know if I really want to move out here. It's really hot out here and stuff. It's still warm, but it's coming down. You know what? Our side is beautiful. We live, you may not realize it, in a resort area. And I know we don't think about our faith as much as maybe we'd like. And I know I don't. I know we don't think about heaven as much as we should. You know why? Because I think out here in the first world, we try and make heaven right here. In this life, we try and make things comfortable, don't we? Don't do it, church. We're just passing through, as the song said. And the pass goes quickly, doesn't it, Beverly? It goes quickly. JJ, who did the contribution, it goes quickly, doesn't it? Life flies by. My dad's 89. Dad, life goes quickly, doesn't it? It does go quick. And we need to remember this. The other side is much better than this one. Amen? Amen? Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Paul understood this in verse 21. He said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul is torn between going and staying. And he said he stayed for the benefit of the church and the benefit of the disciples. His flesh wanted to go be with Christ and go to heaven. I want to think about heaven more. I want to preach about it more. Hence the first point today, right? I want to pray about it more often. Let's go in back to John now. He did talk about a couple other things here in this chapter, but that was the first thing. He's got a room for all of us. Verse five, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. 
From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Even the second thing here is faith. Even after all this time, the apostles still don't get it, do they? They don't understand. And it encourages me because I don't get what God is doing sometimes. I don't know about you. I don't get it sometimes. And in verse 6, he has a very profound statement here. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a very exclusive statement, isn't it? And it's kind of reminded me of a couple things. Remember that commercial, Got Milk? Right there, and then just kind of right there, you just kind of think about it. And here's what he's saying. You want to know God? It's through me. Take a picture. It's like the 2016 Super Bowl, right? It's going through Denver this year. We already know that. Yeah. Right? I already got my Peyton Manning jersey. My friend sent it to me. I'm going to bust it out some Sunday. Get ready. It's going through Denver this year. It's the same with God. You got to go through Jesus if you want to know God. That rules out all other religions. Confucius, Socrates, Judaism, Muslim faith, all of them. It rules it all out. He says, know me, you'll know God. Philip says, show me the Father. We can be like that, right? Show me a sign, God. Show me more. If you're studying the Bible, if you're studying the Bible, if you're visiting here with us, it's great to have you here with us. And we've got a number of people that are doing that right now. It's very, very encouraging. You may want a sign that this is right. Yeah, I've got to have a dream. I've heard that one. I need to have a dream and have God show me the dream, the vision. The problem with signs and dreams is simply this. Is God playing our game? Is he playing the game that we're kind of tossing out there? God comes in thunder, doesn't he? Through the clouds. But sometimes he comes in a whisper. We need to be still enough to hear his voice. The next verse is, he says, believe, believe, believe. Come on, Philip, get your faith on, right? Come on, church, let's get our faith on. That's what Jesus wants from us. God is working in powerful ways. John chapter 6, verse 29 says, the work of the Lord is to believe. It's interesting that almost every chapter of John, Jesus has to try and convince the disciples that he really is God. He's constantly appealing to them to be faithful and believe. Let us not forget, these men were all Jewish. And they were looking for a King David type of God, right? Of leader, of Lord. Jesus was the antithesis to that. And it was hard for them. It's, all, it's hard for us sometimes, right, to believe in a God that's invisible, isn't it? And our daughter, Charlie, is nine, and she'll ask me fairly often, how do we know God is real? Good question, right? Yeah. Out of the mouth of babes comes good questions. And my answer to that is that's where our faith comes in, honey. Look around. How do we breathe? How are we even breathing right now and have air? Where do the plants come from? Where does the sky come from? Where do the clouds come from? The sun. How does it all work together? Creation proves there is a God, and he wants to have a close relationship with all of us. In verse 12, Jesus says, if we have faith, he says, we'll do even greater things than him. That's really inspiring. Consider all that Jesus did. And then he says at the end of this section here, he says, if you pray in Jesus' name, he'll do it. We need to pray more. I need to pray more. We all need to pray more. 
If it is according to God's will, 1 John 5, verse 14 says, he will answer. He'll answer that prayer. And Jesus says, if we pray in Jesus' name. And that's probably the biggest decision my wife and I made on our staff meetings. We did a lot of different things, a lot of planning and things. Is At the end of it, uh, we had about three days together. We went and got some lunch. We were down at Mission Beach, there, which is a beautiful part of San Diego. I haven't been down there. I didn't realize Jessica May is right around the corner. Um, we just sat on that wall there. Some of you have probably been down there and just ate some Thai food. We finished, and then we just prayed, looking out at the ocean. And that was really bonding time. Uh, it was a great time for us to do that, just uh, with God, do that together. And uh, I don't know about you, husbands, but I need to pray more with my wife. And one of the things that we came back with is we want to pray more individually. We want to pray more together as husband and wife. We want to just have more groups of prayer. And we want to toss out, we want to pray more collectively as a church. You know, we may not know what to do in our lives. And that might be where you're at today. I'm sure we have stuff going on. We don't know what to do, but you know what? We can pray. We can pray. All our lives are out of control. All of us. And we need God. It's overwhelming, isn't it? Without Him. One of the things I really want to encourage us to pray for is our faith daily. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not our natural state. Faithless is more natural. Faithful takes some work, doesn't it? It takes the work of God. And lastly, here in closing, in verse 15, he talks about the Holy Spirit. Uh, John 14, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he leaves with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live on that day. You will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Verse 25, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And we had a great class, didn't we, yesterday? Those that made it out on the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells the apostles that he's not going to leave them hanging. He's going to send the spirit of truth, the advocate to help them stay faithful. He says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans to care for yourselves. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who helps care for us spiritually. Amen? The Bible tells us the Spirit counsels us, is an advocate for us, convicts us of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. It's the voice of God that's inside of us. We receive it at baptism, and the Bible says it's a deposit, a down payment of God. What is to come later, we get it all when we get to heaven. And we're called to fan this Spirit into flame. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, and pray for the Spirit to be active in our lives, not passive in our lives. And I kind of equate it to, you may have a, a range at home. We have one on the oven. And, you know, we can turn that on low, right? Get a little bit of a flame, or you turn it on high, and it's a big flame, right, to cook things. And as my wife says, don't cook the eggs on high. You're going to burn them, right? But we can turn it from low to high daily. And that's how it is with the Holy Spirit. We've got to be passionate about spiritual things. And when we revive the Spirit in our lives, we get excited about God's Word. We get excited to pray. We get excited about coming to church, giving our time, giving our money, sharing our faith, shepherding each other. It is the conscience of God that is inside all disciples. When I think of the Spirit of truth, I think about God's voice that helps us decipher between truth, which is God, and Satan, which is a bunch of lies, right? When I think of an advocate, I think of someone being on God's sides who reminds us of Jesus' words. Is the Spirit burning strong in your heart tonight, church, like a roaring flame? Or is it just a flicker? When we get tired, we can get burned out, we can get discouraged, we can lose our vision. As Christians, it's because the Spirit is not full enough in our hearts. It's not active enough in our lives. And we need time to reignite it. We need time to retreat a day away, a night away 
with God overnight, perhaps. If Jesus needed it, I think we do as well, right? We need it. We've got to get excited about spiritual things again. Sometimes we can run on fumes, get down. We need to fill up with God. It's like a car, right? You've got to put gas in it. Fill it up with 92, whatever it is. The same thing, the Spirit needs refilling in our lives. Will you take time to do it this fall? You say, whoa, it's almost over. I'm almost at the holidays. Not yet. we still got three months, right? Will you take time to get away with God? Uh, MJ, I sent her away. We, she needed it to get away with God. I said, you just got to go. Ten days ago, we couldn't afford it. Can't afford it. You got to go. You got to clear out. You got to get some time with God. It's really, really been helpful to her. It's a busy time of year, isn't it? But this is the most important thing in our life. It's got to be the most important thing in our life to make sure we're close to God. He closes the chapter. Jesus says, I give you peace, not anxiety, right? Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. The Spirit is meant to calm us, to give us peace. We're not alone, church. Jesus is with us. In closing, do not let your hearts be troubled. Heaven is going to be amazing, and God's got a room up there for all of us. Secondly, let's get our faith on. Will you believe, if you're visiting here with us tonight, will you believe in the message and what's being preached to you tonight? Third and lastly, the Holy Spirit, the truth, the advocate. It's meant to help us to live as God commands so we can have peace, so we can have calm in our lives and not be afraid of anything, especially death. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, uh, we know that you don't want our hearts to be troubled or overwhelmed. And uh, God, thank you so much just that uh, right, off the bat, right off the bat there, you wanted Jesus to uh, he talk to the apostles about heaven. And God, I want to uh, think about heaven more. I want to read about it more. I want to preach about it more. And God, help us to, even though our sight is very pleasant out here, to live by faith and not by sight. Heaven is better by far than the greatest thing in this life. And God, we want to get there. Uh, we want the whole church to get there, God, uh, to be with you, be with Jesus, all the saints that have gone before us, the heavenly angels, uh, all the heroes we read about, the apostles, the prophets, God, in your word. Uh, God, I do pray that uh, we'll be very faithful, God, as we pray more, that we'll pray for the fruit of the spirit of faith, uh, God, and that we'll pray believing. And God, we know that it's difficult uh, at times to pray and see an invisible God. Uh, but God, you're right there. You've given us eyes that can see and ears that can hear. And uh, I do pray that uh, we'll live by faith and not by sight. And lastly, God, thank you for the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the spirit of truth that comforts us and keeps us at peace and calm and counsels us, God, and convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And pray, God, that we will fan it into flame uh, each and every day of our lives and that the Spirit will be very active as we leave tonight and not passive and uh, like a roaring flame, God, I know that's what you want and uh, that we'll be very much alive uh, in you and in your son, Jesus. But God, thank you that uh, Jesus said he is the only way, the way, the truth, and the life to you. And uh, God, uh, help us to be on that path. Uh, help us to really pray believing. And uh, thank you, God, you're the only way uh, to the Father. And we thank you uh, for giving your life for us. We love you. Bless us, God. Help us to have a faithful week ahead. And fill us with your spirit. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much.